coming even though it's pouring down with rain. Um, we're here to have Andrew Mottram, he's very lovely, I've spoken to you on the phone, and he's going to be talking about Extinction Rebellion, particularly the non-violent protest theory part. Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, thanks for, for asking me. I was saying to, to Ram and some others, I've been to Warwick's campus since I was applying to university in the 70s, and it's huge now. Yeah. I was, we used to call it the university in the countryside. <laughs> very, very different. Um, so on the other end, I'm, you know, I've, 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 I've retired, I'm 66, and here I am with an organisation that Boris Johnson ridiculed, because Boris Johnson does everything by ridicule, as a bunch of crusties, um, and I hardly look like a crusty, do I? So, you want to, we, we'll say then for the sake of the, tonight, that you're happy to accept that the climate, there is such a thing as climate change, that it is a climate emergency, that it is very serious. If you want to have some stuff on that, you'll need to come back a bit later or talk to me afterwards, because I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to deal with um, what Extinction Rebellion is about and how it's come about. Um, and it's very new. Extinction Rebellion was only really formed as an organisation in 2018. It came out of academics, mostly. It came from climate scientists around the world who were hugely worried by what was going on and in, in terms of what the climate was happening to the climate, but nothing was really happening at governmental level because there is this massive collective denial. Some of it is because it's in the too difficult box. Oh, climate change, don't know what to do about it. I won't think about it, or I'll leave it to the clever people to think about, and I won't think about it. So there's a whole sort of collective denial going on for all sorts of different reasons. Um, it's difficult to deal with, it demands a massive change in our lifestyles, it demands a huge change in the economic structures of the planet, the way we've organised ourselves with capitalist economics. There are all sorts of difficult issues. Plus, we've had um, the fuel industry in particular pushing against the climate science, setting up phony research projects, coming out with phony research data which shows that the climate change isn't a problem. <coughs> okay? Then there's this other issue that we know there is a problem, that the scientists know there's a problem and nothing's happening. So what are we going to do? Could we give up? And there you have the child, what did you do in the war, mummy or daddy, you know? What did you do about the climate crisis? And people of your age are far, far more worried than people of my age. I mean, basically, I'm afraid my generation has screwed the world, and you guys have got to pick it up. And that is tough. And I'm one of many grandparents in XR because we are worried about the world our grandchildren are inheriting and feeling pretty bad about it as well and also <coughs> powerless to do very much but we've got to do something there is a moral obligation to act we know that there is a major problem staring the whole of humanity in the face and to do nothing is not acceptable so we have moral obligations to other living human beings, and that's a whole business about ecological justice. We cannot live in a little vacuum of our, of our world. And it is very easy, and we're seeing this, this at the moment all across the planet with different political regimes, in a sense, closing down and shutting out international cooperation. Because it's easier to just live for your own people and run your own country and not actually cooperate. We have this huge um, issue to ensure that the planet is here for future human beings um, because the way we're going on, when I get really depressed, I don't think we'll see probably more than four generations if we're not careful before the global heating, the crisis of food production, of sustainable living, will become so impossible that vast numbers of people will, in a sense, die, or die very young. That is a massive worry that I have. 
Um, to ourselves, I think I'm rebelling because it makes me, I have to admit, feel at long last I can do something. My kids, my kids call me XR Light because I go to the actions, but I make sure I see them. I've got two of my children live in London, and I do other things, and I do as much as I want to do. I'm not doing this 24 hours a day at all. Um, I live in a house which we built. It has, doesn't burn fossil fuels. Um, we, all our electricity is from renewable sources, and we heat the house with wood and sunshine. I try and live as sustained as possible, but actually I'm also doing it because, uh, doing XR, because if I didn't do this, I think I would have to curl up on the sofa and watch telly all day long to shut out reality. And then, of course, the other massive issue is that we're doing this because we share this planet with a huge range of flora and fauna, which is also going to suffer. We know that a fifth of the world's species are under threat through climate change. A fifth of the world's species. And our farming practices, particularly in um, the meat-eating Western-style um, lifestyle, are causing huge problems. When I was a kid, to go for a walk in the countryside would be to listen to endless insects buzzing. You now will not hear what I used to hear. When I drove a car, I started driving when I was 17, and I went all over Britain in the summer, and every day I had to clean off the headlights and the windshield at least three times. Now I drive, and I was running a business, going all over the country, I might clean my, head, my headlamps and windshield once a week. And that is because there are no insects. There's this massive ecological collapse. So, this is the issue. If we don't fix it, why should we fix it? If we don't, how can we live with ourselves? And that's where many people who have joined XR are. They've come because they cannot sit by and do nothing. But knowing what to do is different. Difficult. There have been global attempts. You know, the Rio climate, Kyoto, Paris. This is governmental bodies coming together, partly generated by the energy of the um, intergovernment panel on climate change, which is a UN-sponsored body. They've come together and made all sorts of promises but actually, we haven't done very much. We'll come back to that in a minute. What do we try to do locally? Um, Green Party, of which some of you might be members, I've been a member of a long time, has tried all sorts of things. There have been lots of attempts to get government in this country and government in, around the world to start taking things seriously. But, as Boris Johnson dismissed the XR in October, we're seen as a bunch of nutters. So you have to do it a bit different. None of what has been tried before has worked. This is a really serious graph. So the pink and the black red line is atmospheric carbon dioxide, parts per million. All right? So pre-industrial, 1750, parts per million of carbon dioxide was 278. It is now of over 400. Today there was a notice saying that the parts per million have carried on rising. And the worry is that if it gets to 550, the tipping point of melting the ice caps will be reached. And it's not very far to go. But look at that, 1990 parts per million, about 350 parts per million, first intergovernmental panel on climate change met, the Rio Treaty parts per million were about 375. Then we went to Paris, by then they were up to 400. They're now 408, we've got the Madrid conference next year, and they'll probably be at 450. All we know is that parts per million carbon dioxide keep increasing, no matter what sort of statements we've made. So stuff isn't working. Um, and our use of fossil fuels has skyrocketed. 1800, just before the Industrial Revolution. 1820, the discovery of 
of, of you know of, of how to smelt iron ore with coal, which was really developed in 1840, not far away, at uh, Ironbridge near Telford. And then we've seen this massive increase in the consumption of fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are releasing carbon dioxide at a rate far faster than burning other biomass products. Because fossil fuels are not biomass, they're of course ancient mass. Um, why doesn't it work? Lots of theories as to why. Um, definitely the short-termism of democracy in the West. We do not take the long view. I mean, we all used to ridicule um, communist Russia for its five-year plan and, and that sort of stuff, and we perhaps ridiculed uh, the China for its long-term plan. But we in the West certainly do not do long-term strategic planning. It, is part, it isn't the way we work. It isn't the way we work politically. It's always short-termism. You could say probably the, the two countries of the European Union that have lo had, had long-term plans are Germany and France. You know, Germany's always been very long-term in its view of how much of their economy they will keep as, as base manufacturing. The other issue is that capitalism, the way capitalism works, it sees the planet and its resources as a never-ending source of raw material. And it never costs what that extraction and what, the, what it's doing to the planet and never looks to the future. We've known that global warming, as a scientific theory, it was, it was established in 1850. That as we burnt more carbon and released more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the scientists back in the 1850s knew that that would heat the atmosphere. But we've never costed that into our, our capitalist models of running economies. And we've never done anything about mitigation. And then, of course, it doesn't work because the action has to be global. We live on a planet. And Britain, you know, we've got a large population, we have a large population for the land mass, we consume a huge amount of the Earth's resources, but in a sense, we're what 8% of the planet. And we're going to have to have all the other countries play their part. And at the moment, the USA isn't very keen on climate change and its present government, and other countries where they're still burning large amounts of fossil fuels, they don't want to change because they are emerging economies. People get really worried about India and China as the two growing economies that are consuming vast amounts of fossil fuel. But actually, interesting, China's doing a huge amount. And there are some cities in China where all the buses are electric. How many cities in Britain do we have electric buses? None. We've done nothing about it. So, Extinction Rebellion came to being as a new approach. It started, in a sense, in the scientific community and was taken up by some sort of politics and social science people who realised that there was something that could be done. Um, it was people who were looking at how movements had changed the course of a society or a community or even a nation. Um, do you remember Occupy? Does that mean anything to you? Mm, Occupy, they were a bunch of sort of, uh, unfortunately fell apart, but they went and sat in the, the, uh, in the centres of the capitalist economy around the world and caused a certain amount of disruption. Um, and they were sort of under an umbrella group of, um, of social change and there was this whole thing about rising up. It reminded me of my youth I used to go on endless marches when I was a student. Mostly, um, we used to shout, um, Maggie Thatcher, milk snatcher. That was what she was the Minister for Education. That was a lot in the 70s. Um, and basically, it came into being back in a very short time ago. And there was some two actions, partly in Australia and partly here in the UK, where a bunch of people blocked roads, blocked streets, sat down and said, we have got to change. And that captured the imagination and the interest, 
definitely of the youth vote in some countries, Australia in particular. Um, I don't, anybody from Australia here? You, oh, you've been at that, right. They consume per head more fossil fuel than the Americans. <laughs> the Australians are the most profligate, it is said, to everybody. And they can only live around the edge of the country. My daughter lived out there for, she was going to be there for quite a long time, but hated it so much she came back to the UK. Because she said it is completely mad. It has no understanding of, 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 of planetary responsibility. Um, and so it grew. The other group that joined was definitely people of my era who have watched the planet, who've watched the climate change. I used to be a market gardener and it has grown across the world. But if you look at that map, where is it? Heavily in Europe, yes. Heavily in English-speaking countries and heavily in Western economies. Where it isn't, of course, you'll notice, is in China. There's a bit in India, none in Russia. And it is often also linked, we've got to admit, to open democratic countries. <coughs> Exile's not going to get very far in a place where there is an oppressive government and where protest is not allowed. <coughs> and that's one of its worries, one of the worries that we had. Um, the approach is definitely about non-violence. Um, they use Mahatma Gandhi, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King as the sort of models, um, and it is about resistance. The difference, of course, these three had a huge amount of support from their people. Mahatma Gandhi against the British Raj, and Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King as black Americans against, you know, they had a huge number of support from the black community. And they both had countries where there was a rule of law which was mostly respected. Exile's in a very different place. It's seeking to actually get people's support who at the moment aren't even aware there's a problem. And that's a real challenge. But fundamentally important, though, is about non-violence. Non-violent direct action and respect for the law. So I'm not going to get you out of your seats. When I do this talk in some places, one of the things that non-violence you've got to think through is what about violence against people's property? Whether it's individual property, their shop window, um, community property, you know, trains, their public infrastructure, or their private property. And I would say that non-violence means that we do not damage property. We should not damage property. And so, um, I've, some of the XR actions that have happened, I've not been very keen on. Um, my daughter, the older one, who was in Australia, works for the Department of Transport. One of the founders of XR climbed onto the porch of the Department of Transport and attacked the windows with a hammer and said, you know, she was being a suffragette. I'm afraid I don't agree with that. It has to be civil resistance. And so, of course, it is about sitting down and causing trouble. And the reason is that the social science research guys, uh, particularly Helen, who was at King's in London, if you can get about 4% of the population causing a problem, the government starts to listen. There is a tipping point reached where change happens. And it has to be quite big. It's what, what you think 4% of that population of Britain, well, you know, we're 65 million perhaps. 4%, 2 million? If we could get 2 million people involved in all our actions in this country at one time, then things start to happen. It definitely needs to be focused in the capital city where the power is. It has to be disruptive and prolonged long enough to cause trouble. And again, 
how much trouble can you cause before you lose people's support? And that's a difficult one to judge. Uh, this last October, the police were very heavy and moved us all off the streets and into Trafalgar Square after two days, although there was a planned two-week action. Um, their Section 14 ruling uh, that they, they decreed that that was legal was actually then subsequently uh, found to be illegal by the courts. And the other thing, it has to be fun. Um, and these are the three demands of XR, which are made across the world. It's the same everywhere. The first is that the governments of the world have to tell the truth. And at the moment, they're not. Nobody is actually admitting to the enormity of the problem. We might be in this country more, but very few governments really are telling anything like the truth and the size of the problem. And the pa parallel that's being used is to compare it with the Second World War, when the government told, did tell people what was happening. And we put the country on a war footing and things were made to, you know, to, to go away. Um, the demand on the uh, greenhouse is very clear that 225 is actually where we need to be. And if we can get to 225, that's five years ahead of the time left that the scientists reckon that we have before we reach that tipping point of complete breakdown. And citizens' assemblies, rather than just leaving it to government, we have to get people involved to discuss on how to find the way out of the problems. The citizens' assemblies are very different. Instead of being top down, it's about acknowledging that people have intelligence and they have the ability to do stuff. And if you engage, and let them engage with solving the problems, they rise to the occasion. It's also a great way of making shifting ideas and attitudes. Citizens' assemblies were used in Ireland recently for two enormous changes. One was the whole attitude to gay people and you know, allowing the LGBTQ community to be legal and free. And the other, of course, was abortion which for decades has been furiously resisted. And it was citizens' assemblies that allowed these changes to happen. Um, so 2025, um, because it's, we've got to be immediate. It's got to be soon. The 250 target that the, the Tories have given themselves is basically, if I ignore the problem long enough, either the problem or I will go away. Well, I would say 250 is I will go away. Yes. It's too far away to even contemplate. Um, 30 years' time, they won't be in power, it won't be their problem. And it is not going to work. And we need it now. So that's why XR is very clear it's, 220, it's 225. And the Citizens' Assembly. Um, just to give you those bits of words, sorry I've forgotten these slides, they've slightly changed the thing and I, I, normally I have to do this bit. But it's really about giving groups of people the ability to make their decisions and feed it in. Um, the other crucial thing about the Citizen Assembly, it's not pressured by the corporates. And the corporates have shut down a huge amount of um, climate change debate by lobbying those in power. Um, how are we doing for time? I just want to talk a bit about how it works because lots of people say, how do you work? We want to... Fundamentally, it's non-violent, all right? Now, that's really important. And we have seen the tragedy in Hong Kong to see what happens when stuff gets violent. What was, you know, great, peaceful, pro-democracy pro um, demonstrations have turned violent. Definitely, it would say, because the authorities were violent first. But Gandhi and Martin Luther King were quite clear. If the authorities are violent to you, do not, do not respond by violence. Because it spirals out of control. And it, it certainly has. Um, and this is a great quote from John Lennon, just because, you know, he's a great guy. Uh, 
non-violence, they don't really know what to do. And it's quite interesting being on the actions, having been a demonstrator when I was a long-haired kid, um, and now, the XR demos with the police were hugely good-natured. And although there were one or two bits that went wrong, I found the police really positive, helpful, and friendly. And I was uh, what's called a watcher. My job was to uh, those who were locked on or glued on and had to be removed by the police. My job, one of my jobs, was to make sure that they were treated right. And I would say it all the time. So I was doing watching for about 10 days, on and off, 10 different days. I would say the police were fantastic. Really, I was very impressed. There were a few problems, but there always are. Um, it is decentralised, and this is the trouble with it. It's a very loose, it's a flat organisation. There's no hierarchy, there's no central committee, there's nobody telling you what to do. So I'm in a local group, which is Herefordshire, I'm in a bigger regional group, which is the West Midlands, and that's where we organise the talks from. I'm in an affinity group, which is really to do with my local place where I live, but if, say, I was a scientist or a doctor or something else, I'd be in that sort of affinity group. And it's all fed not to a pinnacle, but spread. And we use WhatsApp, we use Signal and Telegram to spread information. But there is no central authority. And that actually at times can be difficult. So when we were all mightily pissed off with the XR Christians who climbed on top of the tube train at Canning Town, despite the fact that 83% of us had said, don't go near London underground deep line tubes, you know, because they've got the Jesus on their side, and I used to be a vicar so I can speak like that, they, they believed they were right. They did something which not only was stupid, but alienated half of London. Um, we're supposed to have a regenerative culture, we look after each other, where there's very good support. Um, those who sign up to go to prison or get arrested, um, for every one person who signs up being willing to be arrested, there are 20 others who are non-arrestables. So it is, it is a very supportive group and culture, and that's been great. You're not left out to hang out to dry. We don't call it protest, we call it actions. Even disrupting Oxford Circus is an action. Um, people do so small stuff. They do stuff which takes the piss, which makes people think, whether it's a die-in or putting banners in impossible to reach places. It's all part of what we're doing. So I'm, I'm rushing a bit um, because uh, you need to have some questions. Um, it's, it's, but basically, it's a very local thing. The boat came from a guy who got this boat and he painted it pink and he said, do you want it? We'll bring it to the centre of London. You know, it wasn't somebody organising it. it and, it's, and it's funny. Um, 13,000 arrests in the spring, <coughs> nearly 2,000, this was written just before it was finished, 2,000 this October. One of the reasons to do that is, although it causes the police a huge amount of headache, it puts pressure on the courts. Pressure on the courts gets fed back to government. Okay? Pressure on the police gets fed back to government. Government doesn't often listen. Um, any of you remember the Iraq war, stop the war march? Three million people went on that in London. Government took absolutely no bloody notice at all. But save 20,000 of them being arrested that day, they would have taken notice. So it's about gluing up the system. Um, yes, there's a cost to the police. Um, there is a, an issue, particularly with the stabbing rates recently in London. Um, oh, sorry, we've got, we've got some repeat stuff because I couldn't get my notes up first. Um, and that's right, I'm going to stop there because that's then the hard sell, do you want to join? I'm not there here to do that. I'm here to answer your questions now. Has that helped? Has it helped? You're very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at uni, we used to shout out. Come on, yes, questions. Uh, I, just, no, I just wanted to say uh, we have a University of Warwick Extinction Rebellion group and we have a meeting tomorrow at 6pm, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 6pm, if anyone wants to come, up, come along. Uh, it's Find on the Facebook page somewhere where it is, it changes every week, but if anyone's interested, 
have a look from there and come along. Mm. We are here for the hard sales, so... Oh, right. <laughs> you do the hard sell. That's fine. That's far better than an old codger like me. Um, it's been really interesting. Yeah, Carl, you just... Uh, yeah, two questions. Uh, first question, how do you organise the Citizens' Assembly that's effective and meaningful in its impact? And secondly, how do you make sure, like, whenever you, you achieve a certain level of power and platform, it's always... Uh, you always have the danger of being completely infiltrated by other forms of groups and interests ah. that then, then push their own agenda yeah. uh, within that movement. Very good, two really good questions. Citizens Envy for a first thing. Um, looking at how Ireland did it, there was this big question about gay rights was the first thing. And there was a body of people who were totally opposed, mostly driven by the Roman Catholic Church. Within the government of Ireland, there was sympathy, but nobody politically was willing to go out on a limb on it. So the agreement was that they would have these citizens' assemblies, which would be regionally formed via local council areas. And there was a big debate, how are we going to find people to go into them? And it was two, two ways it was done. Um, anybody heard of what's called a Delphi survey? It's a random selecting system, okay? One of it was a random selecting system. So they used the electoral roll and they just wrote to people and said, would you be willing to be on a citizens' assembly to discuss this issue? Now, those who were willing were partly self-selecting but they didn't know whether they were self-selecting because they were totally opposed or self-selecting because they were totally full, all right? Mm -hmm. So that was one random thing. The other thing was to advertise to people saying, we want a citizen assembly, will you form part of it? And there was a commitment from the organiser, so the organisation of the local assembly, because it was a governmental thing, was through their local authority, and the results were collated. But the commitment for the people to attend was that they would give so many hours and the first stage of it was to fully inform them. Um, and that's likewise we, it, what we'd say would be to fully inform people about the global climate crisis. And then to ask them what would you like to do about it. So the gay thing was to fully inform them how there had been these readings of scripture, this experience in life, these different interpretations of different theologies of scripture, and these outcomes of societies which had gone very open and gay. And then the citizens were given the chance to talk about it and to respond how they felt. And there was this overwhelming support to say, what we're doing in Ireland is wrong, but how we should resolve this is not leave it with the government, but give it to the people to have a referendum. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's how you organise. It does take some work. And so XR is saying, yeah, we could lead on the citizens' assemblies, but to ensure that we're not seen as pushing our agenda, it has to be, in a sense, a partnership of government, local authorities, and the academic world as well. Because that's the other thing. Um, peer review and the whole independence of the academic world would be really, really crucial to that. The other one, how do you stop being infiltrated? You cannot. Uh, that's the fact. Mm. And that's one, I think, one of the strengths about XR. It is very flat. Because the danger is, is the infiltration goes up the chain to the top of the chain of command. Um, there has been a huge amount of criticism in the um, city press and sort of the uh, financial houses of XR because somebody somewhere put a post out on an internet blog to say that if we are to stop our reliance on fossil fuel we'll have to change the capitalist economic system that we have now. And that has been taken up by the city and the financial institutions as proof that XR is just a Marxist or a, uh, a, an anarchist organisation. Which it isn't. But it is true. 
You know, the world economy is based on burning fossil fuels. And if we're going to stop burning fossil fuels, we're going to have to change the way we run the world economy. You only have to look at what we're all dependent on. You know. So how do you stop being infiltrated? You will never stop being infiltrated. So the important thing is the openness of governments, governments which is why the local flat structure, I think, is hugely helpful. Um, I now live in Herefordshire, um, which is either very right-wing, Tory voting, farming, or it is full of ex-hippies. Um, and, and we all know each other, we all know each other where we are. But I can see, certainly in some parts of you know, the more urban accommodations, it could be easy infiltrated. And it could be anyway. <coughs> Who knows, you know? Um, we live in a world where all sorts of people have different changes. And it could be that the oil industry is infiltrating us as well. Yeah. But they wouldn't probably take part in the actions. Or maybe they would. Maybe they were. I don't know. How do you stop being infiltrated? You can't. Yeah. Uh, just as a follow-up, actually, you fully understand it. So the, the idea of uh, the Citizens' Assembly, would you then, for each constituency, have your own citizen assembly or the constituencies just organise sort of how the randomization works and then you have one citizen assembly? No, it would be lots of citizens assemblies, whether it's in a, a government cons governmental constituency, it's probably, you know, how easy is it to organise and mm -hmm. the bit that we know in this country is to do it by our, our, our political constituencies. But then they would only have authority over well, the local no, then that would have to feed into, it, yeah, the Citizens' Assembly would have only, it, it, it would talk to its local authority, mm -hmm. to it, but it would also feed into government policy as well. That's the important thing, that it feeds back into government policy. Because at the moment, if you look at the electoral manifestos that are coming out at the moment, it is really only the Green Party that's taking it seriously. Others are saying lots, but the Greens have actually said they will put 100 million a year into a zero carbon um, culture, a, a lifestyle by 2030, and 25 being the target. Mm. But none of those others have really committed anything to it. So, would you only want to have them as sort of platforms for conversation, or actually give them legislative power? They would. You couldn't have give them legislative power, but you give them platforms for conversation. But the commitment that that platform will inform legislation. Okay. That's, that's the crucial thing. And of course, that's what happened in Ireland, that the platform would inform legislation. And they all said, referendum. Right. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm, I must say, this, the Citizens' Assembly is the one thing that I don't think we've worked up yet. OK. We're quite good on actions, but we're not so. And the other problem is, at the moment, we cannot get government We've got some local authorities to acknowledge there's a climate crisis, but you can't get government to actually tell the truth. You think about, you're a little too young probably, when we had the AIDS campaign, it was an extraordinary campaign to deal with um, you know, the issue of AIDS in this country. It was in the 70s, I think, or the 80s, I can't actually remember when it was. It was a huge campaign, and it put the facts before people very, very fast and very clearly. We've not had anything like that, and that's what we need. Mm. We've actually got to do something. Yeah. Just uh, with the Citizens Assembly, I was under the impression that it was going to be national and it was supposed to have legislative power, uh, and it was organised by the Civil Tissue Foundation. And like, it's not like that. That might be very debatable, but that's in the demand. Um, I did not think that was the way. Right. Okay. You are you. A, a, yeah, we're in, uh, it right. on the on the website. I think that's what they have under the demand. Oh, really? Yeah, which is obviously like very debatable. But we've had a big conversation in Herefordshire. We're all saying no. It's got to be informing legislation. Right. But we are not citizens' assemblies are not elected. They're chosen somehow. Sort of foundation does it basically. Yeah. Yeah. So how can you give them legislative power? Is that not the argument of it being beyond politics, it's demographic thing? It's a demographic thing. Yeah. I think, well, okay, we can get to that, and, I, and I'm not clear enough on that, and that's something I will go back and ask her, because when we've had big discussions about it, and one of the things that, you know, in our group we've said, 
to try and get central government to change what we have as legislation at the moment would be very difficult. But you could have a citizens' assembly if it was with an agreement that it would for inform <coughs> legislation. Yeah. But I don't see how you can give a citizen assembly legislative power unless it's properly elected. I, I think the argument is that it's direct democracy rather than... Oh, yeah. Democracy. Okay. So it's well, actually more democratic. It's more, um, but it would still be random, right? Like, it's not it's, it's not direct democracy possible. in the sense that yeah. you randomly just decide... But that we, we allow, we choose 12 people at random to tell us if that man murdered someone. Why can't we choose 100 people at random to tell us yeah. what we should do? I mean, I think politicians are probably less well informed than someone who really cares about something has less... That, that's not really care. It's 150 people chosen on the worst demographic. That's right. That it's representative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, well, you've shown me something that I've got a hole in my thinking here, and I'm going to have to go and bone up, and I apologise for that. We also might be wrong. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, think, I think, you see, I think there has been a push, and how's it going to work? Um, and I cannot, and I suspect that where we work, as my group's an older group, we're all saying, how can you change the way we've run this country? And how can you give a citizen assembly legislative power without a massive act of parliament beforehand? I mean, yeah, we have the House of Lords which has the power, so. It, 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 one of the suggestions were then Excel was replacing the House of Lords, but I know that that's Oh, yeah, 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 so, yeah right, right, again, fine. some groups, it's very lateral. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, because hasn't, the government said they'll have a climate Assembly in 2020, but then because it's got such limited power, it's got tiny limited yeah, power. Yeah, so I guess that's where you draw the line. Absolutely, it's all it is is a sounding board. Yeah, yeah, and it's no commitment. I think this is the other thing that we're saying about the citizens' assembly, and this is what works so well in Ireland. Was that the, the Parliament in, in Ireland said we will listen to what they say, and it will inf it, it will inform legislation. But that's not the promise yeah. that we've had from Westminster, is it? From what I can remember. Yeah. Um, going back to the 2025 goal, mm. so um, a report published by Zero Carbon Britain, which is a um, um, publicly funded uh, commitment from researchers across Britain to find out more about how we can get achieve net zero. It showed um, in its most re recent report that we need around 130 gigawatts of electricity from offshore wind. Absolutely. And in order to do that, we would need around 13,000 more wind turbines. Yes. Which is kind of like around the size of Wales. Yes. So massive uh, amount. Of exactly. Wind so they have said that this would maybe not even be possible by 2030. Do you think that maybe setting a goal like at 2025 kind of invites some sort of unrealistic approach to it? Because people, if they inform themselves, might really see how hard it is, let alone from the energy infrastructure, but all the way to like changing people's consumption, yeah. consumption habits. I, I think that is fair comment. If, you, if it's unachievable, it will never be achieved. I. 2025 is set because it is urgent. If we had built the wind turbines when we knew there was a problem 10 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are now. And that's the problem. We have been dragging our feet for years. And we're still dragging our feet. Um, the current government banned all onshore wind farms because people didn't like having a wind farm in their back garden. Um, you know, we've, we've done loads of things to stop it happening. And so 2025 is saying we've got to make the change. The other thing you're absolutely right, we've got to be far, far more careful about the wastage of fuel. In Germany, <coughs> the air tightness and thermal efficiency of housing is way ahead of the UK's. And it's been way ahead for years. So per house, they use less and waste less fuel. Whether it's electric, whether it's fossil fuel, they waste. We waste vast amounts because we have not tightened our legislation. So we've got lots of things that we, we could and should tighten up. We waste vast amounts. Um, I mean, it's fascinating. I built a house in 2006, we just got what was called Part L 
and it's certainly it's 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 um, on the class. It's it's just on A because we we went over the top of the requirements. But all the kits that we needed had to come from Germany because we are not manufacturing any in this country. Right? Why not? Because our legislation hasn't bothered. Why hasn't it bothered? Because the house builders in this country, and it's, we have what we call the big five house builders in this country, who build virtually everything, they don't want to improve the thermal efficiency of homes because it costs them too much. All right? So there's all sorts of things. So that's partly why 2025, if we were more efficient, and if we consumed less or wasted less, we could do it because we wouldn't need so many wind turbines. Um, there, there, you know, it is un it, it, I think it possibly is unachievable, but I think it's a sensible target. Um, 2050 just means we put it off. And we've been putting it off for years. You know, the first climate change intergovernment panel was 1990. And we'd known about climate change before that. I worked as a market gardener in the early 1970s before I went to university. We were aware of climate change then. We didn't know what the size of the problem was going to be, but we, I worked in a place that had been work, operating since the, between the wars, and it's opened in 1931. They kept weather records and season records, and they were saying the climate had been changed. We saw it in rainfall, we saw it in rainfall patterns, the way we lost what you call soft, there's a hymn, soft refreshing rain, and we get rain dumps. When you'll get, you know, four centimetres in, in an hour. The climate's definitely changed, and we have done nothing about it. And so that's why 2025 has been chosen. Um, also, I think I would say is that the people who were a bit negative about it are being negative because of the glacial speed of change in this country. If we saw it like we saw the problem, I was even getting seven A's, but certainly the Second World War, we would have shifted legislation very fast. And we have, and it's in the too big a problem page. Well, uh, but draw, you know. So we just leave it. <laughs> Renewables are, are, are not the only answer, though. We have to be more thermally efficient, and we have to consume this. Um, actually, like through speaking to a lot of people and friends, even quite many are quite apprehensive about extinction rebellion, especially because it does seem quite like anarchist, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, what can people in extinction rebellion do to potentially reach those more apprehensive? Points? Fine, I think that's very fair. I've, I suppose there's bits of me which is a bit anarchic, so I quite you know, like it, but I've been saying to extinction rebellion, to our regional group, and to the guy I work with across the West Midlands, is that we're appealing to the wrong people. We need to get partly the people in suits, as I call them. We need to, to, to get to them. And we also need to get to the people who um, are working in low-paid, long-hour jobs who are just about surviving. And at the moment, it has an image that it's all a bunch of hippies, which it isn't or it's all a bunch of layabouts because they can take two weeks off work and go and protest in London. Um, I think there's, 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 a, there's a lot in that. I think Extinction Rebellion has to do a makeover and it has got to become, I don't want to say the word mainstream, but it has got to attract some people in the mainstream who can give it, in a sense, uh, a public face which is more acceptable to those who are sceptical. Mm. The problem is that how do you protest in this country? How do you protest anywhere? How do you make an action for people to be no to get noticed? You have to cause trouble. That's the only way because government isn't listening and so you have to cause trouble. And and that's that that be really brings you into conflict. I'm not quite sure how to unscramble it. Um, 
I, 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 you know, I'm a lone voice. I said, we've got to get rid of the bongo drums and the dreadlocks. I went to XR wearing a, a jacket. I didn't put a tie on, but what I heard was that the police were nicking anybody who looked a bit dodgy. So I went wearing what I used to wear when I went to work. Because, yeah, we've got to play a game. Um, I think some of your friends might be anxious partly because if you're going to take HR, XR fairly seriously, you realise there's a lifestyle change that is necessary. And people are pretty worried about that lifestyle change. Um, you know, I, I now will not fly. I've decided not to fly. I'm very ambivalent about that decision. Uh, but and there are lots of places I want to go and see but I won't fly um, I don't eat much meat anyway I'm not saying people should stop eating meat I think we've got to look at how we farm I think we've got to look at what we consume um, I, I try never to buy from Amazon you know, there's all sorts of individual decisions we make we're all compromised, um, and XR is trying to make a noise about something that we've got to all need to listen to. Um, yeah, if they're worried about it being anarchic, it possibly is a bit. But we're not going to change anything by being part of the status quo. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could appeal to people through <clears throat> For example, the Citizen Assembly, because I can see that being quite popular. I, I think it would. Now, what's really interesting me, I was in a meeting last week, I worked in heritage buildings. Uh, just so you're aware, I used to be a parish priest, an Anglican parish priest for a long time, but I had to reach an agreement, agreement with the Church of England, which was not to work too closely in it. Um, and so I went into looking after heritage buildings, because we've got lots of heritage buildings. Um, and so I met a whole raft of different sort of people, people into conservation and historic buildings. I was at a meeting last week to discuss a cathedral project and discovered that on this committee of about 10 of us, I was the youngest at 66, but there were three other members of XR there. They're likely because we're worried. We've seen the planet change. We, you know, I, I've seen it in my lifetime. The weather systems change. Um, and I think a citizens' assembly would be a great way because it means that we're actually, hopefully, randomly collecting people from a cross section mm -hmm. in society. Where XR is completely failing to get people is those who are working, you know, though the people who live in tough, um, low economy parts of the society. Yeah, at the back first. Oh, and then you. Uh, I have two questions. So first I will start with, why was it named as Extinction Rebellion and not maybe something like Extinction Respond or something like that? Um, I don't know. And actually I hate both the name and the logo. I go off record for that. The <laughs> logo to me, although it's supposed to be an hourglass, um, looks more like a hard right, far right <laughs> symbol, all right? So I have worries about that. And I agree with you, Extinction Rebellion. Um, I think it, it was the same, we're rebelling against the extinction for which we're heading. But I still have problems with its name. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay? Yeah, uh, another question I had was uh, about the citizens assembly. I wanted to ask, uh, just uh, based on like, the question and answer sessions, is it really a good idea to select people on random? On, or, on random. Is yeah, it really random. On good, random? Yeah, is it really a good idea to select people on random for the citizens? Um, you've got to do it two ways. One is a random thing. It, it's a control system. Uh, it's a way, um, there's a, a, a really interesting research project which was about finding answers to difficult questions where nobody knew what to do. And it's called a Delphi survey. And one of the crucial things was stuff what you were selected completely at random. At the same time, yes, have another group, 
and maybe then put them together, which is selected by a pro by all the profiles across the, the socio-economic and gender profiles, everything in age. But at the same time, that's quite contrived, isn't it? Or, or, or rather than going for like a, a group uh, which is sort of like either completely random or completely uniform across different profiles, why not go for a more educated group, or like you said, from the... Difficult to do that, because that is elitist. And one of the problems with citizens, uh, with, uh, with, with citizens' assemblies, they've got to represent everybody. XR has been hugely criticised because most of the people who are in XR have university education, and we're not touching the people who don't go to, you know, don't get through university. I don't want to use your time. Get up and go when you want to, but I'm quite happy staying here because I can talk. Yeah, we have time. You know. Usually cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, sorry, you had a question. Um, yes, so my question was, so you basically mentioned that we should include uh, the most sort of marginalised, low-income... Um, I'd love to. Yeah. ...demographics of society. Do you think it's a good idea to also encourage these people, like a state of uh, extinction rebellion, to basically go under mass arrest and so forth? Because often it tends to be the case that a lot of low-income, marginalised groups tend to also suffer from the criminal justice system. Absolutely, and that's one of the issues. And I think we have to be very careful there. If you're white and arrested, you're treated a very different way than if you're black and arrested. Definitely. And so, if you, nobody in XR has to be arrested. All right? You choose to be arrested. You volunteer. You volunteer. Because the only way the police can arrest you for, for, on protest is obstruction. The first thing they have to do is to say, if you do not move, I will arrest you, okay? So you move. You get out of the way, all right? And that is how it works in this country. It doesn't work like that in every country, let's be frank. So, if you're going to be arrested, it is that you have resisted the instruction of the police. So, if we manage to recruit large numbers um, of black, Asian, and other foreign nationals into XR, great. We would have to take great care that they were not put into situations where they'd be arrested. Because you're right, they suffer disproportionately in the criminal justice system in this country. Okay. Could I ask a follow-up question? Um, so let's, because it is, like I said, something that is widely encouraged by Extinction Rebellion, do you think it is actually um, a good solution to encourage mass um, arrests in general, because it's, it tends to be quite a consumption of resources and time, yeah. but does that really lead to what the group stands for? The evidence is that civil disobedience does lead to change. And that is the evidence that XR is using from Gandhi's protest in India against the British re colonial regime, and the black Americans' protest against the oppression that they were experiencing, particularly in the southern states. Even though, you know, eventually the legislation changed, they still received a huge amount of disproportionate prejudice. <coughs> um, the reason is, is to put the system of the status quo under stress. Because if I'm honest about it, I would say the status quo that we have in this country isn't good. Britain the whole of Britain is based on property ownership. Well, I am one of those sort of left-wing people who says that property ownership is nearly theft, because I would say they're four God-given gifts, land, air, water, and sunshine. So how can anybody claim that they own something that is given to the whole of humanity? Now, we can have ways of holding land and the gifts of the creation, but not at the expense of others. And I don't like everything that we do in Britain. I think our status quo isn't good. We have an electoral system which is not proportionate. First past the post is totally unfair. And in two weeks' time, I don't know how many of you are registered vote, but if you're not registered, you've got until tomorrow. So you better do something quick. I think it's tomorrow. Yes, it is tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, we're getting off the off the off the subject. <laughs>
Yes. Um, can I just respond to, to your question? I yeah. think there is there's I think increasing I don't know if you do agree with this from your experience, but at least in our group I think it's something we've been talking about a lot is like the limitations of the mass arrest strategy and I think there is a, a broader move as well to be incorporating other tactics as well because I think as you said there's it, it's proven to be effective but there are other things you could be doing and perhaps there are limitations to the mass arrest. So I think that's one of the benefits of the non-hierarchical structure is that we can kind of crowdsource these ideas and that it's a flexible approach and we have this kind of learning and reflection and reaction. I think that's really, you see, that's why I think the talks are so important. Yeah. Because actually, I mean, I've got two kids living in London. One of them works at the Department of Transport. She found particularly the second action an absolute pain in the arse because she couldn't get to the office. She had, you know, Westminster was full of it, full of people like me, like her dad. And, and she said it was really difficult. She said, I don't mind that, but when they came and break the windows, then, yeah, I was pissed off. And we were very close, I felt, in the October action of pissing off actually the people we were trying to get support from. And so I feel it's really important we do this education, the education bit. So I'm, I'm now on the list for the WIs of Herefordshire. You think WIs, old ladies who make jam, they're not like that at all. Women's Institute's an extraordinary movement in London, it's full of young people, but I think if we get into those sorts of things and get the message out to people who are not like us, it's really, really important. Yeah. But a mass arrest is to put the system under stress. That's what it's about. So, you know, when, when you know, and I know it's all a bit romanticized now because we weren't there, but, you know, when Gandhi starts getting people to make salt so they didn't pay tax to the British, and when he starts getting to spin cotton so they weren't buying cotton made in Lancashire and exported out, but becoming self-sufficient, the British began to wake up to the fact that they could not keep the Indian Raj under their thumb. They could not suppress the people of India. Anyway. Yeah, I'm afraid that's all the time that's we have it. for questions. Um, thank you everyone for coming and let's give one more round of applause.